fine, but like I had some earrings that messed them up. So this time I got them like professionally pierced, like with the needle and whatever. But let's not talk about needles. Someone might pass out. Um, do we ever consider animals underwater to be aliens? I think that they consider us aliens. Like this bright light comes out of nowhere. They've never seen light before. One of their friends gets taken, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. They probably tell stories about us. Yeah, they're like, what was that USO? <laughs> Unidentified swimming object. Yeah. Oh, we've got our first Hemi Corralio. Wow. Means Do you want to zoom on that? Into that depth. Um, no, but I do want to zoom on this if we can get there. Okay. Just come into a nice little patch of corals. Mm -hmm. Seeing quite a few different species hanging around here. Got our standard uh, Rumilagorgia militaris. That's Hemicorallium. We are now zooming in on a bamboo coral. I saw some Primnoid corals, some Chrysogorgia corals. Can you zoom in, please, Aaron? So the one in the back oh, is the a Primnoid coral. And the one in the front is the one I wanted to look at. Okay. Back up a little. Yeah. Diana. Okay. Oops. So this okay. is a bamboo coral. Zoom in again, please. I think it might be nodally branching. That's what I'm going to check out if we see the branches at the nodes or internodes. Oh, no, I think I'm wrong. It looks like they're internodal, which means that they're branching in between those black bands. Yep, internodal brancher. Seuss. Thanks. It's hard to tell. Sometimes. They're nodally branching or internodally branching, and that puts them in completely different groups. And some, I've noticed, will branch both internodal and nodal, and that just blew a bunch of our minds recently, that some corals can oh. do both. So what is it then? We've been calling it ambinodal. <laughs> Undecided. Nice. Undecided right branchers. Here. You know, that's going to be the name of the group in, like, Latin. Whatever the Latin for undecided branchers is. is yep. gonna, it's going to take a committee of, like, 50 people. To... They do what they want. No judgments here. Uh, do we ever look specifically in the ocean for fossils, or can fossils even happen in the deep ocean? Yes. Um, yeah. Oh, my God, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and the geologist just woke up. Hey, Coralie. Hi. So there's a whole branch of oceanography called paleoceanography, which sounds like paleontology. And it's essentially looking for fossils in, you know, the rock record of the ocean. And they're really important because these, we can use them as paleo proxies. So if you get some information on those and know how they form and different things about them, we can get information on how the past ocean, how the ocean has changed over, you know, millions of years. So like, let's say you take a core of uh, sediment and you have this record for millions of years, you can go in and look and see maybe, oh, like the ocean was depleted of oxygen, you know, three million years ago or something. And that um, beaked whale skull that we found on the last cruise, would that have been considered a fossil? Uh, because it had the uh, ferromanganese crust on it, so it's old. It is old. What? Okay, so what are we considering a fossil? Let me. Look. That is the question for you. I think there might be like an age when people think things are a fossil, but also okay. While you're looking, we've got another one. Why don't clams get married? Why don't they? Because they don't like to be tied down. <laughs> Coralie's thinking about it. 
<laughs> okay, so preserve <laughs> remains become fossils if they reach an age of about 10,000 years. So I would say if it has a ferromanganese crust on it, you could probably assume it's a fossil. Cool. Very safe assumption. Before anyone asks, we did not pick it up because we did not have the permits to do that, but we did mark where it was. Coralie, what is the strangest geological formation you've come across, either visually or just in research? Strangest formation I have ever come across. Um, okay, so is it, I don't know if it's strange, but if you guys have ever been to Bryce Canyon National Park, it's really cool. Um, the way that the sediment gets eroded there forms these things called hoodoos, which are these little pil pillar structures that come up. Um, that's a really specific w uh, erosion technique that r I've only seen happen at Bryce, and I've never seen it happen anywhere else, and I don't think there it does happen anywhere else. I, so I think that's pretty yeah, cool don't hear and many weird. Places um, like that. A lot of geology college students go to this place. Um, it's called the Palita Folds. It's like in between, it's in the White Inyo Mountains in California. And it's kind of famous in the geology, like college world for field work because there's just this crazy amount of folding and faulting. And you can see all these different um, rock types there. And no one really knows how it was formed. Um, and actually the cool thing about it is it's never been professionally mapped because uh, all of, I guess, the teachers and professors you want to use it for uh, teaching, so you can't cheat. <laughs> but yeah, so when I was in between going into my senior year, I went on field camp there and I was able to map it. So it was pretty fun. Yeah, that is cool. When we were in knowledgeable, yes, I was in knowledgeable in high school. Uh, the answer was never erosion. So even though the question was perfectly set up, like it could have been a question about those rock formations, but the answer would not be erosion no matter what. <laughs> so I don't know why. <laughs> hey, hey. I guess I could just do this on SPL. Um, so I guess you probably got the message that we, we want to go to a pretty solid clip to get to the top. Um, I just double check distances though, and we, we can slow down a little bit from the pace we were at. Um, we want to kind of maintain 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 knots. And we're aiming to be off bottom at 6 a.m. Sounds good. Yeah, it sounds good to us. Um, I will call out if I see anything really interesting, but it just seems right now that we're seeing the same things that we've been seeing the last few seamounts. It's all interesting, right? It is really interesting. There's nothing not interesting. I'm just like, for sampling um, <laughs> purposes. Yep, yeah, Roger. I understood. Yeah, Roger. There's nothing fresh. Yeah, fresh and new that hasn't been documented yet. So I'll shout out if I see anything new that we haven't seen yet during this dive or this expedition. But other than that, I think um, we've got a lot of these Ramilla Gorgia, which are cool, uh, but we don't need to spend a lot of time on them. Getting to the summit is definitely our priority. So this question says, for them, a fossil is like cracking a rock open and finding an imprint of an old organism, but there could be different specifications for the deep ocean. There's different specifications for fossils in general. Want to talk about what fossils are, Coralie, or is that, is that a you thing? I guess either of us. I don't know. Do you know that much about fossils? Um, I'm not very well versed in fossils. I'm also not super well versed in fossils because I'm not a paleontologist. Um. But, yeah, I mean, what I read online <laughs> was oh, that a fossil is considered, you can consider something a fossil after 10,000 years. But I think generally it's something that was alive at one point and it gets preserved in some sort of way. So one way you can preserve fossils is like if you have like a fern leaf or something, for instance, and you like it leaves an imprint in a rock or something, that's also considered a fossil. You don't necessarily need the actual fern leaf to be preserved. This is an operations question, Megan. Is there a particular reason why we start at the bottom of a seamount and work our way up as opposed to starting at the top and working down? So the ROV, uh, it's easier to drive going up because we can 
look upwards, so that's a more of an op ROV operations question. Um, it's just easier and safer to, to head deep and then go upwards rather than going downwards. So, uh, for example, earlier in the dive when we were transiting uh, across that midwater section, that, that was a little area on the seamount where there was a saddle, so it dips down. It would have been very difficult to go down there with the ROV and it could be potentially dangerous. So that's why we transited midwater and um, are now on the new, this new slope uh, heading toward the main summit of the seamount. Another geo question. How do the rocks get their unique shapes? We are seeing a lot more bulbous rocks in these uh, uh, seamounts today than we had and maybe seamount C earlier. Yeah, so it has to do with how the magma cools. And so these kind of have a more pillowy texture. Um, so what happens is when something erupts underwater is uh, you can imagine magma is super, super hot, thousands of degrees Celsius. And then the seawater here is really cold, like about one degree Celsius. And so what happens is once the magma comes in contact with the cold, hot magma comes in contact with cold seawater, the top of it that's like touching the seawater uh, kind of hardens really quickly. But since the magma is being constantly pushed out, um, it'll kind of create this tube so the magma keeps coming out of the tube uh, and then it like forms over again the top of it, but it keeps pushing on. So it creates these tube structures that we call pillow lavas or pillow basalts. They do look nice and soft for a rock anyway. They would be nice to sit on, nice and round. Yeah. No jagged edges. Yeah, but ferromanganese crust stain so much really so you would get like black stuff all over your clothes Aww. oh that would be a bummer you just wear black all the time but maybe if it was fresh pillow lava that just cooled without the ferromanganese crust <laughs> really hot lava well, well just I mean, cool. like, just it just cool. it's cool like you know maybe after Maybe 20 years. That's <laughs> cool. <laughs> it's very, very well cooled. It's geologically fresh. Geologically fresh. Geologically fresh, but human, humanly cooled. <laughs> well, there's a neat sea star. What do you see? Oh, I star. saw a sea star. star. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, so we were just in a zip. Zip mode time. Yeah, we, we are trucking. Try to get the next one. Says it's interesting. So the pressure and cold can preserve bones and such in the deep ocean. Well, the other thing though is that don't like in the deep ocean, you know, like a whale fall or something. Don't those bones usually get eaten unless they're like very firm? There were bone eating worms on the whale fall that we found. Yeah, so a lot of the bones would have get, gotten chewed up for nutrients. That's I think why we don't find more. Guess where are you hanging out? Yeah, the big question is, where do the, the bone-eating worms come from? Like, how do they know how to get there? How do they find the whale fall? Smells like bones. Smells like bones. <laughs> they just, yeah, they just know. But, like, what if you're really far away? Bones, apparently, are very strongly scented. Oh, yeah. If you've ever smelled dead whale or whale bones, you would know. <laughs> it. It is definitely a smell that you don't easily forget. I can back you up on that. <laughs> it is very stinky it and it sticks around forever. Like you What's hang the out. Smell? Oh, it's it's um it's strong. Like what would you compare like can you compare it to something? Uh like a hundred times worse than if you left chicken in your refrigerator too long. Mm, I know that smell. I've, n I've never I've left chicken in my refrigerator for too long. No, I haven't, but like sometimes like eat, I've gotten a fresh pack of chicken that like had a smell to it. It's like, hmm, this is suspect. So Yeah, so like whales have a lot of fat. Um, and oh. so like that yeah. smell from the fat just, 
it like sticks to things. So like if you have whale bones and you put them in a freezer and that say that freezer um, stops working and gets warm, the smell will never come out. Did that happen? Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> Uh, has anyone gone swimming during an expedition? I think we uh, can make oh. swim stops, right? Uh, uh, can you zoom in on that? Well, it depends on the ship. Uh, this ship may allow swim calls, but most ships do not allow swim calls. Here. We haven't in a, a long time. There was a point where they did do swim calls, but not recently that I know of. Not in the last six years, I don't think. Yeah, not but since we left the person behind that one time. Oh, right. <laughs> there was that. Okay. Uh, and in these waters in particular <laughs> for this for expedition, zoom, you can? I wouldn't get in this. Really yeah, uh, there's always that concern of sharks. Um, uh, I lost like it. today Sorry, at dinner, Aaron. there was a oceanic white tip. Oh, you saw one? I Aww. did, I saw one. And a mahi-mahi. What? Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, they swam right by each other. Oh, and everybody it. asked me if uh, they would try to the shark would try to eat the mahi. And I was like, the mahi's too fast. <laughs> it would happen if if it was like dying, oh, not yeah, doing well. In. <laughs> but like, yeah, the, the white tip isn't gonna even try to go after a mahi. It, it's too much work. They're too lazy for that. Glad it knows its limitations. Mahi are really, really fast. Coralie, are there caves or caverns in the deep sea? Uh. I I don't know. Caverns, know as right? As much as I do. Chasms, chasms. There could be lava Definitely. tubes. Yeah. Yeah, there could be lava tubes. I'm sure there's caves. I think I think there are caves because people go scuba diving in like deep underwater. Sea. Deep oh, sea. deep sea yeah. caves. <laughs> yeah, people go scuba diving in deep sea caves. Uh, that would be impressive. Yeah, someone should try it. Don't After you eat the magnets, go try again. deep sea scuba diving. Do not take life advice from. From Team Blue Water, none of us. Yeah, I don't know Coralie. if there's a uh, deep sea caves. Not good for life advice. <laughs> <laughs> Especially Coralie, you are yeah. correct. Hey, you know, scientists start out by being really curious. So I'm... Is that what you are? <laughs> what would it be like to live with a mucus roommate? <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag mucus roommate. Um... It just keeps going, this bamboo coral. Oh, there it is. There's the top. Hey, buddy. That was such a long one. Oh, there's another bath of pathies. Coralie, can you walk us through uh, the process that forms the ferromanganese crust? Yeah, so... There's still a lot of stuff that we don't know because um, ferromanganese crusts were recently discovered, I think, in like the 70s um, and kind of by accident. And so the things that we do know, though, um, are they start as ferromanganese oxide or manganese oxides and iron oxyhydroxides. Um, and those each have an ionic charge to them. And so they're able to pull out like special, like metals um, and put them into their crystal lattice. And they form over millions of years, but they are a type of hydrogenetic rock, which means that they form from the water. So you can imagine that the seawater chemistry probably has a lot to do with the chemistry of these rocks. Uh, some people think that it might be uh, microbially mediated, the growth of these crusts, but also that's still something that's not really known. Uh, there are some factors that we know that we think aid in crust formation and nodule formation, and one is being below the CCD, uh, not having like a lot of sediments, having currents that are able to sweep sediments away so that they can keep growing, stuff like that. And you said a little bit earlier there was uh, a mineral that the ocean was kind of 
lacking a little uh, low end, but the crust was high end. What was that? S something. Cobalt? No. <laughs> Cobalt does not start with a s. Uh, it was, oh, I can't remember. Cerium. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, so it's, uh, cerium is an element. You can find it on the periodic table. I'm going to take a wild guess and say it's element number 57. Again, you haven't memorized what the periodic guessing? table? <laughs> what is element cerium is? I'm, gonna I'm, guessing, that that it, I'm guessing it's 57. Wait, cerium is C-E? C-E, yeah. Hang on. 58. Damn oh, it. You, oh, I was still thinking. Oh, you were, oh, I didn't know you were trying. I'm sorry. Ooh, it's so shiny. It. There's not a chance I would have got it. It's a soft, ductile, silvery white metal that tarnishes when exposed to air. Good but guess with 57, enough. though, by the way. Yeah, I was... <laughs> oh, it's yeah. kind of like potassium. Yeah, so the cool thing about cerium, when I, was, when I did a preliminary study, uh, I got my rare earth metal or rare earth element pattern when I got all my concentrations. And it looked kind of, normally when you get a rare earth um, pattern, you normalize it to chondrite. That's what you normally do for lavas. Um, just so you can see what something is more enriched in or not. Um, but when I normalized mine to chondrite, it was crazy because it was super enriched in things that uh, these like, Con like crust rocks are enriched in. Uh, so I normalized mine to seawater and it was pretty cool because it was just kind of showed the opposite and especially yeah. with cerium. There's a cerium anomaly in the crust and there's a cerium anomaly in the seawater. Um, and so cerium is really depleted in the seawater but it's super enriched in the crust. So you can kind of assume that all the cerium is going to the crust. That was a really nice sponge by the way. That foldy woldy wibbly wibbly. Yeah, the foldy woldy one. That one it was a feria, another type of glass sponge. And, and glass sponges are literally made out of glass, correct? Yes, they are literally made out of glass. Find that wild. Wild. What do sponges smell like? What do they smell like in like real life? Yeah. Uh, they don't really have much of a smell. I mean, um, when we bring up the sponge, you can smell it. Oh, all right, I will. Does it smell like the ocean? Yeah, it just smells like seawater. Okay. Doesn't well, glass doesn't really have a smell, like cool glass anyway. Yeah, I mean, if you if you let the, the one that we've dried out in the lab, might be a little stinky. Okay. Like, it, it'll smell lightly fishy, but not like bad. Just sort of like ocean, like the shore. Ah, so question in the chat. Wait, rocks grow? Please yeah. explain. Yeah, that's how, yeah, rocks grow. That's how you make rocks. Well, except for metamorphic rocks. Um, Let's walk through each type of rock and oh. how it grows. <laughs> There's three different types of rocks. There's igneous, metamorphic, and sedimentary. So how you make sedimentary rocks is you, like, as you can probably see here, you have a rock and then you just start stacking sediment particles on top of it, and then eventually those get compacted and form into a rock. Kind of like a uh, snowman, like you're compacting more snow and it gets bigger and bigger. Yeah. Um, and then after then, different things can happen to it. Uh, but so, like, erosion and stuff like that. So you can see cool sedimentary rocks in the Colorado Plateau. So Grand Canyon, all of those great national parks in Utah. And then igneous rocks are pretty cool. You can either get extrusive rocks or intrusive rocks. Extrusive rocks are what we see here on the seafloor. They're all basalt. And then, or you can also get other types of volcanism, like rhyolitic volcanism. And that's a more explosive type of volcanism than basaltic is, and that's just because it has more volatiles and a different gas content than basaltic volcanism does. So that rock grows by basically spewing lava out of yeah. out of the earth. 
Yeah, essentially. And then you can get granitic rocks, so like what you see in Yosemite. Uh, those crystals actually do grow, so because it's intrusive, unlike extrusive rocks, which have to cool really quickly, um, intrusive rocks can... Wait, we should talk about this. I don't know. I think that was a cusk eel. Or, no, maybe it was a cutthroat eel. Try to find it again. Oh, uh, yeah, cutthroat eel. Look at them weaving through the corals. What's the one that uh, usually swims with their Go nose tipped down? Will the halosaur. Yeah. I can actually keep it in view. This one's a hung up on kind rocks. of a big one. Dotty? Oh, no. But yeah, so <laughs> granite grows underneath the, the Earth's crust. And because it's not as, it doesn't have to cool as quickly, the crystals are able to form and crystallize on a lot slower time scales. So that's why granite has oh, like a bunch of different colors and you can actually see the minerals in it. Whereas in volcanic rocks, um, the minerals are really small and sometimes it's just glass. Okay, I'm gonna catch up again. So intrusive rocks, are those rocks like dike rock? Yeah. So it's, uh, I guess it would be magma, right? So you're inside the Earth's crust and stuff is spewing different places. Yeah, but also it could just be cooling underneath the crust. Mm -hmm. Like maybe there is a magma chamber that never got a, like a plume or something, like a vessel to go up. Um, and so then it just crystallizes inside. And then over time, like what you see in Yosemite is that that was once inside the Earth. But over time, plate tectonics takes over, erosion takes over, so it erodes the Earth's crust so that you're able to see that. Nice. So am I right in saying that rocks that cool more slowly are more stable and harder? Or is, is that right? I don't know if I would... I don't know. I don't know about that. But they are... They just... They have bigger crystals than volcanic rocks. So a bigger crystal doesn't necessarily equal more firmness or stability. No, yeah. not necessarily. I've just noticed that, like, um, when there's dike rock, that the dike tends to stick around longer than some of the basalt that's around on the outside. Like, if, if you're going on a hike around on the Hawaiian Islands, you might see uh, a dike running through, and it seems to be much more intact than the surrounding rock. Mm, yeah. Um... It might be like the composition of the dike. I'm actually not quite sure. That's um, a nice rock. It is a nice rock. Already flagged the video. That's a sweet rock. Look how cool it is. So metamorphic is a whole another ball of wax, right? Yeah. Then you have metamorphic rocks, and that's just when you take a sedimentary rock or an igneous rock and you subject it to high temperatures and pressures, and you literally change the mineralogy of the rock. Yeah, this is fun. Fun little ridge. Look at all these little, look at this bio, you guys. My gosh. Oh, it's so colorful. Yeah, we got little hemichorallium. You got that actinostolid anemone, that big one. There are a bunch of primnoid corals. Got cool um, rock shapes. Yeah, really cool rock shapes. <laughs> all these like tiny little norellas that have their associate brittle star hanging out. Those are those little orange things that you're seeing all over the corals. Lots of little small corals. Okay, you can come wide on Argus Zeus, please. Thanks. That was a nice little dense community there. Yeah. Corals seem to really like these boulders. Anything that looks bouldery, they tend to just gather right on top. Oh, and then we've got one of those really, really long bamboo corals. Oh, 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 whoop. How high will it be? It's always a question, isn't it? It's amazing how high they go. Yeah, they just they just keep going. Have we ever found any ancient ruins? Oh, we found um, sunken ships, mostly on purpose. Um, 
Have we gone looking for any ancient civilizations? I don't think so. Uh, it's unlikely we'd find ancient civilizations on sea Makes Aaron work on the focus, the too. Pacific. Like, rack and focus here. in and out as you get yeah. slowly. It's really hard. Ever. Good challenge, yeah. I'm definitely looking for Atlantis. It's been found like five times. Yeah. There's a bunch of sunken cities. I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry to burst your bubble. <laughs> Except I also deeply love Atlantis, so like no shade there, but it has been found many times. I think that's an Aritagorgia that I just circled on the screen. Can you zoom in, please? It just looks spirally, and I don't think we've zoomed to an Aritagorgia yet. Yep, definitely a spiral. That's good. And I believe I saw a shrimp hanging out in the branches of that coral. Speaking of bio, as we're working our way up, um, do we usually expect to see a higher concentration of animals at the top of the summit compared to the bottom? Oh. Oh, we're working out some technical stuff back here. While they do that, um, I will answer this question about the name of the expedition. Um, so it is a very long, it looks like a very long word, but it's actually multiple words. So it's Lu'ua Ea Ahiki Ke Kualonokai. So if you break it up into all of its individual words, it's not that Can hard to pronounce. Can you this guy, please? Here's another cool sponge and the family subfamily Bolosomini. So this is related to that ET sponge, but it's not quite the ET sponge. Very yellow. It is. It is very yellow. So like the ET sponge, it has that osculum or hole um, right there on the like back this? side. And on the other side, um, the ET sponge would have those sort of eye looking structure but that one sort of just does a little little concaveness to it so it's not quite the et sponge and this is the second uh, nice anthemastus that we've seen kind of a big one more orangey than pink we zoomed one of those earlier and again we're seeing these Rumilla gorgia militaris sort of almost bluish tinged white corals. So, um, oh, the question from earlier. Uh, oh, there's a cool fish. Oh, hey, buddy. Go ahead and zoom in. Or not. Sorry. But, um, are we expecting to see a higher concentration of animals at the top of the summit compared to the bottom, and why would that be? Oh, absolutely. We're, we're definitely going to see more animals uh, uh, at the top than at the bottom, and that's usually it. a function of food availability. The deeper you go, the less food there is. And this is a, uh, a cusk eel. It's a grumpy-looking cusk eel. Yeah. My goodness. <laughs> Definitely has very heavy ridges along the eyes. It's a rough life, buddy. Mm -hmm. Gosh. So, cuskeels are in the family Ophidiidae. He's hiding. Oh, oh, yep. That was that was a good close up. Little guy. That was the first cuskeel for this dive. I'm going to take a look at our animal guide and see if I recognize what that cuskeel could be. Could be a, a basagigus.
So another geology question. Um, we're seeing a lot of uh, basalt covered in the ferromanganese crust here, but are there any uh, major uh, rock formations other than the volcanic basalt that we could see under the seafloor in the Pacific? Major rock formations? Um, I mean, yes. So in the Pacific, on the Abyssal Plain, there's a lot of sedimentation that happens, so I guess that would also be a major rock formation as well, but um, oceanic crust is made from basalt, so mostly you're gonna see basalt here. How do we search for fossils in the deep ocean? Oh, yeah, we definitely don't uh, grab a rock and crack, grab a rock and crack it open in order to find fossils. I think if a fossil's there, it's just going to say hello. I'm a fossil, and uh, there's not a specific type of rock that would that we look for to have a fossil inside. Correct? Um. Oh, you go. Oh, yeah, I've, I've got an sea. idea. Deep sea. So, um, areas of the deep sea that may have at one mm -hmm. point been above oh, yeah. water or near the surface might have fossil corals. Oh, yeah. And those areas are now at deeper depths, usually in the, the 700, 500 meter range, which is still considered deep sea, but not nearly as deep as where we are right now. And scientists interested in those um, corals might go down pick them up and crack them open. Nice way to prove me wrong, fine. It's and okay. also you can uh, look in sediment cores of um, different places. And Inside a what? Sediment cores. Oh, yes. Um, there's a bunch of different places that have sediment cores. They mostly stay at different rock repositories or different universities or institutions. Yep. Um, and you can generally uh, like rent them out like you would a book. I have I have touched the sediment core. It's a weird little thing. No, okay, it's not little. It's like it's huge. It's like well, it's not huge either. They're like a meter. The ones that I've handled, they're, they're like slid in half. I feel yeah. like sediment cores come in many lengths. Probably. Well, they chop, but like the repository I was at, like they they're super super long, and then they get chopped into regular spaces, literally just to fit regularly in the racks and the tubes, yeah. and then sliced in half. Yeah, meters, yeah, a good size to keep them in. Um, so the way you core is also kind of interesting uh, because a core can't go all the way to the depth you would want to core. So you actually core at sites near each other. So you would have like an A and a B site. And so you would core, let's say, from like zero to 10 meters. And then you would start the next core to the side of it. You would core from like maybe like five to 15 meters and you want to get that overlap so that you don't miss any of the um, possible fossils. And then you go back to your rock repositories and you cut them in half because you use one for science and then you use, you keep one um, just to have on hand. I'll be on a coring ship next year. So how often have I said the name of the expedition? A lot, but I actually practiced it before I got here, and I started doing Olelo Hawaii on Duolingo. Now I do not speak Olelo Hawaii, but, you know, I've had like three Duolingo lessons, so that says something, right? You know a bit. I know. I know nothing. It's an interesting <laughs> language because it, it has uh, fewer consonants than I'm used to, so a lot of the words look very similar, mm -hmm. and uh, it's... I would probably need some flashcards, too. I remember everything. Navigations, Erin, do you have time for a mapping question? Yep, sure, go ahead. Um, the mapping that we've been doing while we were here, did we find anything of interest? Um, well, I don't know. I find the seafloor interesting. Everything. <laughs> Everything's interesting. <laughs> we found some cool uh, volcanic features like low we call them donuts um, they're not they're not high enough to be a sema but they're these really nice very circular very perfectly circular features on the seafloor um, covered a couple of those um, and we covered quite a bit of like abyssal plain um, which is not 
super exciting, but somebody's got to fill it in, so we did that. And we've been doing a lot of gap mapping on this expedition because the seamounts are almost all completely covered. Um, when we can, we cover any gaps in the seamounts, but um, as we were struggling with some weather over the last couple of days, um, we just used the time to fill gaps in the, the world database of uh, seafloor mapping data. And a lot of that was in some flat areas. So that wasn't super exciting, but it's still useful. I was very interested in that donut. <laughs> I was invested. Where can people go to find the mapping data that we collect? Um, our data goes to um, both Rolling Deck to Repository, which is hosted by Lamont. Um, and from there, it will go into the GMRT grid um, next time they have a release. Um, and then it also, after it's at the Rolling Deck to Repository, it is fetched by NCEI. And that's probably what most people are used to looking for when they're looking for bathymetry data. That's the NOAA. National Center for Environmental Environmental Information. Um, they have a whole Bathy database page, and you can go to a part of the world and and select an area and get all the track lines. Um, part of the problem with that data set is it is unprocessed. I don't think they're hosting the process data yet, though they're trying to work on it. Um, so you'll get our our data before we've cleaned it. Um, we clean all of our data, so that would be the better option if you wanted to work with this data. And you can still just contact OET as well if you want um, any additional data from the crews, like process products and stuff like that. We can provide those. So um, we had a question about the crew's name. So there are four cruises in this um, I don't know. What are we called? It's a, it's a group. Like we're doing a specific in the season. Is it the se no? Because one of them extends to the beyond the season. But we anyway. It's we have thirty minutes until shift change, so my brain is starting to shut off. So there's every time we visit Hawaii, the Hawaiian Islands, they want to build the story of our expedition. So in order to do that, we have um, an exp a, de a chant that goes along with the expedition. So kind of like um, when. Uh, People used to navigate, or they still do, do wayfinding um, in the Hawaiian Islands and traditional sailing techniques. Um, they would remember the path to a place through a particular song or a particular uh, sequence of steps. So we have one for each of our four expeditions so far. One is happening in the spring in the next season. I think they plan to add a line every time we come. And I know all four of them because I had to memorize them. This one um, represents the uh, journey and work to the Kualanokai, which are sea ridges. So I think the actual translation is like dive down and back up to the sea ridges. And you can find all of that information on nautiluslive.org under expedition. And you can look at the 2021 expeditions and they are all listed. Exciting. Oh, did you see that rock? It looked like a big thumb. <laughs> I was like, whoa, that came out of nowhere. <laughs> it's telling us we're doing a good job. And an awesome job. With regard to coring, how deep does the fair manganese crust go? Not very deep. It forms on the top of things. So you wouldn't see it in a core. Because you core sediment samples and uh, ferromanganese cross forms on basaltic rock, so it's a different type of rock, too. You might see some um, nodules, though, they grow on the seafloor, but I don't think you would want to core in an area where there's a bunch of nodules. Megan, we've got our infamous color question. Why do sea creatures have pigments at these depths? 
hypotheses. All right, uh, let's do a zoom on this coral. It also has a pigment, and it's got this really neat crinoid on it. That's purple. Zoom in, please, Erin. That's my new Perfect favorite crinoid. Example. Yeah, so uh, we've been on. calling Yelling. that crinoid yep. Sathometra. Now zoom in. Sorry. It's in the family Xenometridae. Yep. And this coral looks like it is internodally branching. Oh, cool. There's a little tiny jellyfish on there. It was over on the right side. To the right tiny right little red side. jellyfish right there. So this red jellyfish actually feeds on the coral. So it's it's holding on and, and eating the coral. Oh, it's crazy. It's so little. Yeah, it's so little. Okay. I believe the name for that little jelly is Aegeonia. Yeah, so anyway, colors in the deep sea. It's a color it's a question we get quite often just because, you know, you think everything would be white down here because color shouldn't matter because everything is dark. And and that can possibly be the case, but uh, a lot of volatile compounds tend to have bright colors and those volatile compounds uh could possibly deter predation on the animal that has that color. Uh, and the animals that have those colors are likely not uh, getting rid of them because they're, they're advantageous to have a compound that keeps you from getting eaten. And there is no real disadvantage to being, say, a purple color in this environment because it is pitch black down here. Uh, there is no light from the sun, and the only light available is made by other animals using bioluminescence. So you don't have a lot of animals down here that Choo -choo have zero. the same visual acuity as a person would. So, yeah, we can see and like say, oh, there is this really bright orange thing, or this is a really bright purple thing. But for animals living in this environment, they didn't bring all this bright light with them. So that that color isn't really attracting attention in the same way it appears to be attracting our attention as we're observing them. But it can be advantageous uh, to be, say, transparent or red in this environment. And that helps you not be seen by pred predators or things that want to eat you. I wonder why we don't see more black things. Black things, uh, I think it's just difficult to have that type of pigmentation. Uh, you do see a lot of black uh, in midwater animals. So like dragonfish, um, bristle mouths will tend to be a silver or black color. Um, ectopian fishes might be, you know, a silver or black color. So um, maybe some angler fishes are, you know, a brown or black in coloration and and that can also help keep them hidden and animals living at those depths might they might be at depths that you know still have a little bit of light if they're living a little bit shallower and that could be advantageous to hide being see-through see could be advantageous uh, or uh, have say a red stomach um, you could be see-through, but your stomach is red, and that red can help counteract uh, anything that might be glowing because of bioluminescence that you ate. So if you ate something that bioluminesces, you wouldn't want anybody else to see you because you've now consumed something that glows. Um, are there any species that have moved from shallow water and uh, headed to the deep, evolved to adapt? Yeah. So or the other way around, uh, for that matter. It could go both ways. Uh, animals that have adapted to the deep and, and have started uh, living in shallower waters and vice versa. Animals that are known from sort of shallow water reefs have adapted to living in, in deeper waters. Um, Plexora corals are uh, one of those cor corals that are brightly colored that we think 
are have probably come from shallower waters and now living deeper. And we're not going to see any plexorg corals at these depths. You usually don't see them until we get a little bit shallower. And at our current depth, we're, we're looking at corals in the family Primnoidae, uh, Chrysogorgidae, Coratoicididae, and Hemi or Coralidae, the, the Hemi Coralliums. Um, we're also seeing black corals, the Antipatheria. So this is an example of a black coral. And black corals are actually in the uh, hexacorallia. So they have six t uh, arms on their polyps, so six tentacles. Um, while octocorals have eight tentacles on each one of their polyps. Oh, yep. Let's, let's zoom this fish. What kind of fish are you thinking might be a cuskiel? Oh, no. It is a rat tail fish. This is a little kumba. I love that name. Kulpa or Kupa as in Kupa Habana? Kulpa. Oh, with a K. Yeah, K -U -M -B -A. I, I went all Latin on it. <laughs> like said non Kupa, may I ask? <laughs> like Kumbaya. Yeah, something like that. And uh, just to reiterate, there is no photosynthesis going on this deep, correct? Because there's no sunlight. No sunlight, no photosynthesis. And so if it's pitch black down here, how did the fish not bump into the rocks? Like... Well, sometimes we see them bump into the rocks. Yep. <laughs> so, fish bonk is a very common thing yeah, to see here. So I don't know. I, they probably bump into the rocks quite often, uh, especially on those cutthroat eels. You often see scratches on their sides. Oh. And uh, that's probably from rubbing against rocks. They like to sort yes, of fit themselves into crevices and stuff. We've got our favorite fish, the Chonocops coloratus. I'll turn the ship around for it. <laughs> <laughs> We've seen so many of these. I'm sorry, listen to Trevor. It's cute. And we will still turn we the ship around. We can step zoom on the Chonocops. Because you're pulling me. We know what it is. Yeah, we can't get over that guy. Sorry. It's okay. We, we don't need to see it. I know maybe some viewers at home are disappointed. We're not looking at the Chonocops for the hundredth time. But, I think Aaron's um, the most disappointed. <laughs> They are cute every time you see them. There are plenty of videos available with all of us talking about how adorable they are. We love them. But it's not absolutely necessary to view each one. I don't know. I don't think that. I don't know if that fish is gonna get offended that we didn't take a look at it. We wouldn't want to offend anybody. <laughs> but in terms of science needs, another view of Chonocops is not high priority. Yeah, but when the scientists are happy, they do good work, right? I'm pretty happy, and uh, I mean, I love a good Chonocops every now and again. I could totally go for a new fish, though. I want to see a new fish. Oh, wow. Like the Chonocops the fans are going to, the stands are going to get The Kumba. It's so cute. Wild. That one's pretty cute. We got a good view of that fish. Oh, here's an interesting theory question. So when you see color, like when our eyes perceive color, it's actually a reflection. And it's like, I it, uh, don't remember how to explain this. It's like the um, we're perceiving whatever is not being absorbed, I believe, into the surface. So it's basically a light thing. So, like, the color that we're perceiving is because we're shining light on it. So I'm wondering, or they're wondering, and I am too, um, you know, without the light, I don't know what, like, what, I don't know what they think they look like. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so there is the, the light available um, from bioluminescence. 
um, is usually in the green to blue spectrum. So if you have like a, a, a flashlight that has a green or blue filter and you shine it um, in a room, things are going to look different than they would with white light. You're not going to see as many colors. Also, the animals themselves may only have a certain number of photoreceptors. So humans have three different kinds of photoreceptors that help to see uh, red, blue, and uh, green light. Right? Red, blue. And these animals that uh, are living down here probably only have photoreceptors that you know, see the in the blue green range because that is the light that's avail available to them. So they likely don't even see red light. They just there is no there no need for photoreceptors that are sensitive to that color. Oh yay, another rat tail fish. This looks like a coraphanoides. Oh, and it might be gravid. Um, looks like the stomach is a little distended. Fish bonk. <laughs> yes. Prime fish bonk right there. Yeah, I hope that viewer was still watching. <laughs> There's your answer. Yep, they definitely do bonk into the rocks. Oops. Oop. <laughs> we weren't making fun of you. It's just, it's just something that happens. This could be uh, Corphanoid. Corphanoides and longest series possibly was looking to see if it had those long filaments. And either this fish uh, had a real big meal recently or it is a uh, pregnant female. Pregnant female? Mazel tov. <laughs> so we're going to do watch change in about 10 minutes. Um, this is a 24-hour-ish dive. Uh, the plan is to leave the bottom at 6 a.m. tomorrow morning, Hawaiian Standard Time. So uh, it'll be around then, but you know, things change depending on how, we, how quickly we can get to the summit. But that is what we are looking at. No, I think somebody's catching up on the live because they just asked what they missed to make hashtag mucus room made a thing. You <laughs> didn't miss anything. It's just multiple Coralie stories. It'll be fine. Everyone make mucus roommate trending on Twitter and I'm going to tag <laughs> my roommate. <laughs> that would be amazing. Uh, oh, Question about the bright light. So, does it? How does it affect the uh, fish that have eyes? Because not all of them do. Yeah. So, so fish that have eyes um, that are using them, like uh, this fish hanging out with us, Tuskeel. Actually, this might be a Bazazetus. Ooh, it's a new fish for the dive. This is a Bazazetus. Another type of Tuskeel. I know this because it has these kind of small eyes on its head, very blunt nose. And so so a fish like this might see the lights of the ROV and, and feel a little bit blinded for a moment or two. In the same way you might feel blinded if someone came into a dark room with a flashlight and shined it in your eyes. But after a while, uh, they recover and go about their, their day.
I love how fishy it's getting right now.